Hey, what's going on, guys? Dom the Movie Nerd here, and have you heard the good word? Game of Thrones is back! Well, not really, but the first official spinoff, House of the Dragon, is set to premiere next year on HBO, and that got me thinking about how Game of Thrones, the number one most watched show for a decade, just seemingly disappeared from the culture after that god-awful finale. And I wanted to find out why, which is why I'm proud to present the newest hit show from the Talkin' TV network, Talkin' Thrones, the new weekly show where myself and friend of the channel, Professor Pat Huber, get together to break down each and every single episode of this hit show. We've got focus character segments, we break down the lore, we go over some old reviews, all to get to the question of where did this show go wrong? It's a really fun time. You guys are not going to want to miss this. So head over to the Talking TV channel on YouTube and Spotify to check it out. We go live every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Audio goes up the following Saturday. It's going to be a really great time as we once again battle it out for the throne. All right, I am back with the one, the only, Mr. Dustin, the Duster, Mason, my longtime friend as the co-host for today. Chris could not be on due to obviously his busy school schedule. And in his own words, quoting, he didn't want to be here for half of an episode in which he had not watched any of the previous source material because we're talking about the prequel movie for The Sopranos, the movie that we both have been waiting two years for Probably actually a little bit longer because I think it was it might have been announced back in 2017. The many seats of Newark, in addition to unfortunately Venom, let there be carnage. Dustin, do you have anything to say before we get this started? It's got to let's just do this, man. I can't oh, wait man, to I, talk. I know I know where you were going with that, though. I know where you were going with that. on man it's been a minute i know right it's also been a minute since uh venom was supposed to come out (laughs) and that and now it is out and i was so uh, i I finally came out well all the way back up back up back up first off because again we we gotta i'm sorry we gotta do with this what we did with the suicide squad you got to explain obviously famously the last time that he was on dustin explained his origin his backstory with the with suicide squad built into the suicide squad yeah now dustin please do the same for Venom yeah. and the journey towards Venom. Let there be carnage. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. Um, I was going to say, like, I was really looking forward to this, like, probably more than most people. And I didn't even really love the first movie, but I thought it was kind of just like a missed opportunity. There was like, if you watch that first Venom movie and you feel like mixed on it like I do, it's because it feels incomplete. It feels like 40 minutes was gutted out of it. And Tom Hardy even like acknowledged that while he was promoting the goddamn movie. And it still made a bunch of money because it is Spider-Man and Tom Hardy's a likable star. And it was, and it had cool action, admittedly, you know, in my opinion, it had cool visual effects in my opinion. But uh, this one, I, like they, with this movie, they got a new director who Andy Circus out of nowhere, they could have gone with an R rated direction, which I thought they were going to go. And then R, 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 rate, R rating direct. Yeah. Direction. Yeah. And I thought, I, what's the point of venom? If he can't like see his bodies, his victims, I know that's a little morbid, but it's a movie. I don't care. I want to see it. And like, uh, it's, they, they really just re- rely on like lighthearted humor and it. And I, and this one, this movie in particular felt more than the Ruben Fleischer one of like a 2005 Ghost Rider movie. Like, like to me, I know, I know it came out in 07, but it feels like a mid two thousands movie. And it feels like in the vein of like Daredevil and Ghost Rider, even though I like Daredevil for what it was, but like this movie is just like, it, it, it just feels exactly like the first one in terms of like, it feels like 40 minutes has got it out of it. It feels like, there isn't a consistent tone. There's the violence was like gutted out of it. And I just, I just don't get the point of it anymore. And then, and then we'll talk about spoilers later, but uh, yeah, that's all. Yeah. I, I mean, took the words right out of my mouth. You pretty much, I, I'm sorry to say you pretty much had like exactly literally mm. what I was thinking before, mm. as far as, um, as far as my thoughts go. Like I watched yeah. this, 
And immediately I'm like, shit, I'm in for another movie that's on fast forward. I've, I've like, yeah. I, I've seen so many of these in the past. It's like the movie is already at such a breakneck pace. Like you can tell that like the opening scene is one of the sloppiest opening scenes I've ever seen. And already I can tell I'm in for this ride where I'm like, oh God, this is going to be exactly like the first one in the sense of it's bad humor in the sense of it just kind of like tr- trying to be this weird mix between like this strange rom-com with this like bizarre ra- black rated R like blood fest, you know, mm-hmm. except they can't even show that because of the PG 13 rating. And I think the only thing that, ag- that aggrieves me more about this one is the first one at the very least short as it was and gutted as it was, there was like still something there like story wise. Mm-hmm. But after the fact, like wh- with this one, I'm like, bro, wh- was there even a story here? Like, I, I actually did have to ask myself that question. Like, was there, like, I, mean, I know that, like, that's technically, that's but, such a trite question, I know, when it comes to these types of superhero movies. But, like, with this one in particular, it's like, okay, because also this one is, like, the only one to kind of go outside the grain, go outside the mold, as far as kind of the for, superhero cinematic formula that's been established by the studios over these last couple of years. Mm-hmm. This one is the only one that dares to go outside the mold. And it's like, but what are they giving us? Like, I, I, I don't, I really, I don't know what audience these movies are marketing to. But for whatever reason, it works because apparently, again, the Spider-Man IP is so strong that even the name Venom will bring people out. Because like, the the box office numbers from the first Venom movie alone still, be, still like befuddle me. Like, how that I mean, movie made that much money? Like, <clears throat> talk about. I'm just putting it up to timing, like luck. Like, I mean, you worked in the theater, obviously, when that came out. Like, would you yeah. have any insight? I mean, it's not like it was even one of those superhero movies that was like, you know, the line was out the door, like, you know, sold out screenings and right. shit. It wasn't like Endgame or Black Panther or even like Captain Marvel, but yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. which had at least one sold out show, Yeah, which I'll give that movie that. But uh, this movie is just like, yeah, it just does, brings nothing new to the table. I mean, I guess they added a little bit more humor, but even that felt slight because like the the subplot of the movie with Woody Harrelson and, and Naomi Harris is so inconsistent. Bro, I don't even know what strange. that was. I, I saw that and I'm like, one minute I'm like, I'm having fun. The next yeah. minute I'm like, what the fuck is happening? I'm like, I, 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 yeah. I, I'm, I'm in two minds of it. And then the end, of course, it has the typical generic CG super, like super villain third act and like again yeah. this is but here's the weird thing even with that scene which is clearly like the most cg heavy heavy like the scenes where like venom is getting poked up by carnage and he's like crawling around like pretending to be in pain but it's like the, these things aren't bleeding there's no sign of any physical damage and they've shown that they could kind of like take the damage like they take damage but then other damage is like too much for them to handle like there's a weird inconsistency with the power structure that these venom symbiotes have going on and then, like aside on top of again another poorly lit awful all over the place they're at action sequence i'm like what, Dude, what is even the power scale here like i'm legitimately confused i mean the thing that was confusing me about it was like woody harrelson becomes carnage because he bites because he bites eddie brock's finger and like yeah. sucks some of his blood which yeah apparently and then, that's how the symbiote is merged with him yeah and then as soon as you know and the in the climax when venom sees its carnage and it's it a just red, absorbs it back into him I mean, that's the very end, but like, no, but right before the the fight, you know, he's like, oh no, it's a red one. What the fuck? Like, I just didn't understand like the mythology of like, what, wait, what? Like, what, what? that, what's okay, the difference? Like, he, I don't. Here's where I'm, I'm going to put my comic book hat on just for this once, because the weirdly enough, that exact section of the movie was the most comic accurate. Like, that's quite literally what happened. It wasn't quite like. Yeah. Eddie Bro- like Cletus Cassidy left across the table like bit some of Eddie Brock's finger it was like a piece it's like they were actually in jail at the same time is the thing like Eddie had just okay. been arrested for being Venom and then when the symbiote because okay, he had been separated from the symbiote the symbiote came back to remerge with him and then when they remerged as Venom and escaped a piece got like knocked off and left behind and then yeah. that piece went on to to um to Cletus Cassidy to form Carnage. Like that part of the comic book mythology of the character of Venom is actually pretty cool. For us, like it's just this like never ending, constantly spawning spawn that could just like take over these things, turn them into like super beings, and then like consume their husk and leave them. Except I understand for, like, the one individual who can handle it. I absolutely understand what you mean, and 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 that makes more sense the way you put it. But in the movie, it's in the so movie? goofy. Fuck no. Fuck it's no. so goofy because it's, it's like, hilarious. why would you be scared? Like, he calls you father or, like, he calls him dad or whatever. Yeah. And it's like, 
you could be more powerful than your right. son. Like what? And you, and he ends up beating him anyway. Uh, right, spoiler. Exactly. Sorry. But yeah. like, oh, uh, wait, 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 wait. You mean to tell me that in a superhero movie, the good guy beats the bad guy. Wow. Say it ain't so. I know, but like sometimes those mo- these movies, like you know, the, the, they, the they, villain they, they really like the, didn't they die. Like, they like the they bait leave, and switch. They and, like the bait and switch. You know, like uh, like Yaya Abdul Mateen and the next and Aquaman and Aquaman two. Yeah, Electric Waterloo. Oh my God, fucking! I I I ah, uh, I have such mixed feelings in the first one. You know this, but like I don't know. Like, oh, I just, Venom, I just that just came to my head. I'm just like saying. like the only other thing that I really want to talk about. Like, I, do we talk about the post credit scene? Do we spoil that here? Because like no, to be honest, uh, that's the yeah, only we, we can talk about that. I you want to talk about that? All right, so we're quick. I, mean, I, I got mean, hold of wait. I got to put the spoiler alert first. Like people, yeah. for all those who have been listening to this point, if you do want to get doc. If you do not want to get spoiled on the Venom Let There Be Carnage post credit scene, click out of this video now and then click back in after like a little bit. But like click out of this video now if you don't want to get spoiled. So, Dustin, yeah. this post credit scene, um, obviously, just to kind of set the scene, obviously, it's Eddie and Venom just still conversing on this random tropical island that they retire to, whatever. All of a yeah. sudden, boom, big flash of light. News report comes onto the TV. It's the scene from the post credit scene of Far From Home when J. John Jameson exposes Peter Parker to the world. And so it's clear Venom has now been transported into the MCU thanks to whatever multiverse shenanigans hoppings are happening in um in Doctor Strange 2 and Spider-Man 3. Like th- dude, it already this, all doesn't this make is, sense. All this does to me, all that this says to me, I know that this is to me the only thing people are gonna be talking about because it's the only thing that effectively kind of makes this movie and kind of this franchise relevant is the problem because fucking uh, if not for the fact that they're gonna bring him into the MCU somehow. Um, fucking like then these fr- these movies just don't make sense as far as like kind of their existence to be quite frank. But now obviously that he's in the MCU, now he has a purpose. Um, now he actually like it's like oh wow, there's like sort of like almost this reason to continue watching this character. But like I guess the hint should have been there at the beginning of the year in Wandavision when they brought in Evan Peters that like. I guess since Disney does technically own all these characters like with their deal with Sony and now with their ownership of 20th Century Fox that they can like kind of just continue to bring these characters in willy nilly. Like obviously we know about the return of all the original characters from both previous Spider-Man franchises in um, No Way Home that comes out in December. Like so so like that that's kind of all this scene said to me, which is that it's like, OK, so this confirms it like Disney literally has control over everything now. That's not Universal or Warner Brothers. Like, yeah. I don't know. Was there like anything in this for you? Like that that's all that scene said to me. I mean, it's it's what you said. And but like, it just doesn't make sense to me at all, because like, why would he just why would that moment happen at the same time that J. Jonah Jameson makes that exact broadcast? Why is it the same thing? from like f- far from from yeah. uh far from home at the end of Two far from years home. ago which also again kind of puts this movie out of date because i think this movie still takes place in like relative like 2019 or something yeah. like, i don't know these movies no, are in a weird timeline i mean but. that makes more sense like to me if like if they're gonna do that i mean i i would it makes no difference to me where it's set but like the fact that it's just like it's a parallel dimension. It's so stupid. Yeah. It's like, it like, why can't he just be in the regular? World? I don't get it. It's yeah. Stu- like, and then Morbius is going right. to be most anticipated movie of all time. Oh my God. Just like, stop speaking that movie, dude. I purposely am it. ignoring that movie and hoping that Sony can't just wait. cancels it. But like now, because we know that Morbius was going to be set in the venom verse. And now obviously this explains whole reveal explains the Michael Keaton showing up in Morbius reveal. Cause now either Morbius can just be set in the MCU or it can be set in the venom verse or like in whatever, multiverse they want really because mm-hmm. that's that, that's just what disney is doing now that is what they're they have slowly been revealing that they have been revealing that more and more with the what if animated tv show like they're just in control of everything now and even sony it's funny because sony would had been like being so newsworthy by like oh they're breaking against the mcu mold even though they weren't they literally just kind of cashed out in order to like salvage their studio's existence because the hack and and the loss apparently on amazing spider-man 2 was so much that they like had to end that franchise completely mm-hmm. and now they're kind of mining that IP, that previous IP for what they can and just kind of mo- remodeling it and repackaging it and like capitalizing on their, it's almost like, it's so cynical. They're like cashing in on their tiny, tiny piece of the nostalgia brand IPs that are left that uh, that don't completely belong to Disney. It's really fucking sucks as far as, far as that goes because like mm. it diminishes what could be relatively good movies. But like you and I both talked about our problems with the MCU Spider-Man movies. But um, yeah, Venom, final star ratings. Venom, let there be carnage, I should say. I mean, there's a few things I didn't get to touch upon, but like the act, like I still really like Michelle Williams in it. I still think she brings 
enough personality to it and enough charm. And I, th- I still think she's really good in it, even though these, that character is like nothing. But and I like the guy, Reed Scott, Reed right? God. That plays, yeah, he's Who just gets too. abused in this movie. That, but he has that cool moment with the flamethrower. He shit. does. Yeah. He does. Like that was kind of that was pretty cool, practical, but it was cool. And then I like, and Woody Harrelson is. It's sad that like, yeah. I like that animation that they do. That's kinda yeah, like right. Like I like the his like his backstory that he does. Yeah, it's pretty good, honestly. Yeah, by like, the way, there are parts of this movie that are good. How did how did Eddie Brock read that postcard that he sent? I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean that he could barely yeah. speak because of just like Tom Hardy's accent in that in those movies, but no, I, 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 don't, I don't know. know. I don't know. I mean, he is a journalist. Maybe he does have eyes for details. So I don't know. Yeah, not enough uh, clips of Tom Hardy investigating and Agreed. reporting. Agree. Like in the first movie, he's like, and that's like the whole first <laughs> act. That's like the whole incentive is like him solving this mystery that like literally yeah. puts this dude on death row. Yeah, it was like CSI Venom. I like <laughs> it. it was very much like that. It was Just like, where the- are the bodies? Yeah. <laughs> fucking loved it no two and a half two and, two and a half, half and a five yeah, yeah. Uh, well, oh man i'm already trying to remember what i gave it i gotta re-look it up on letterbox i don't remember if i gave it two two and a half but yeah venom two th- this i don't care if it was gutted by the studio this was just one of the most disappointing movie experiences i've had at the year it was boring it was it, sorry i shouldn't say it was boring it was rushed it was kind of unkempt it was like just all over the place, switching tones in like that typical like schlocky studio hack job way where it's like bizarrely funny one minute and kind of ridiculous and over the top and super violent, but in a PG-13 way, like mm-hmm. it, 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 it kind of becomes a little bit egregious like that. And so, yeah, I gave it the same as you two and a half out of five stars. This is this is not a good movie. And I'm disappointed because it's already on track to make like 71 million or something opening weekend, which is nuts because that's. Again, but in as far as pandemic or like post pandemic movie terms go, that's like you know what that's probably one of the best uh, openings that you could hope for as yeah. far as that goes. I but, wonder um, who, who's going to direct the next one. Oh God! I don't, should, we, should we spitball it? Should we spitball it for a second? Yeah, sure. Um, John Cole Sarah. How we call it, Sarah? Okay. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go balls. I'm gonna go David Leach. I'm going to go David Leach. Ooh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally see him do it. Perfect. That would be awesome. Like, that would be good. You know why? Because David, David, David Leach <laughs> is the guy that would make it rated R, right? And he's also the guy that would actually consult Todd McFarlane on like how to make it like even more like rated R. Like he would, he would do it right. Like imagine, imagine if you mix like kind of like the seat. Yeah. I'm telling you, like Todd McFarlane is supposedly still making his Spawn movie. We don't know. I'm Todd McFarlane. I created Spawn. Yep. Uh, but that was our review for Venom. Let there be carnage. Venom 2, a uh, symbiotic boogaloo. But um, let us know your thoughts in the comment section below uh, as we get ready for the main podcast discussion of tonight. Dustin, like I said, we've been waiting. We've been waiting three years for this, right? Three years, right? 2018, would you say? At All right. Least. Yeah. For the Sopranos prequel movie right Mm -hmm. obviously we both have a long history with the sopranos just in general as far as that goes but like this is a rarity because this is again i've been listening to so much soprano content in the last like two days it's been nuts but like this is one of the very very few things you know because i mean you're always the guy that's recommending stuff for me to watch and telling me stuff to watch right but this is one of the few things that I like kind of recommended and pushed you to watch. As, if, if I mean, in first. a way, in a way, if I mean, first. you're not the first person, but like, I just like you convinced me to like get back into it. But I still really like it a lot. Yeah, it's it's one of those shows that like a lot of people have talked about. It's, it's one of those shows that a lot of people have talked about just in general over the last couple over the last like two years, right? Obviously, like we, we have the resurgence that happened during the pandemic, but also we have um uh what's it called? Uh what's it called? We also have the resurgence over the pan because of the pandemic, but we also it was weird because like it was already hitting this like strange moment in 2019 for the 20 year anniversary. And then people just started rewatching the show, like out of nowhere. Like I'm even fit, almost done with my rewatch too. I just have the final episode, uh, the final seasons to go. And like, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm going to try and skip over like some of like kind of the main 
uh, points that have been pointed out that everyone has pointed out. But like, yeah, this show is it's, it's one of the greats of all time. And I guess the one thing that I can kind of contribute to this conversation is like just how real and authentic it feels just as far as like portraying these spirits. Like this to me is like one of the first shows I, I really ever watched where it's like the characters felt like real human beings, even if a few of them were over exaggerated, like each and every character and kind of the level of depth and humanity that David Chase and the creator and the rest of the people who worked on the show brought to it added this real authenticity that really very few shows uh managed to capture after this i'd say the wire and breaking bad are the next two that come the absolute closest but it's one of those things where again you don't like hbo it's kind of been in the movement of where hbo has had obviously like a decent amount of tv adaptations of some of its biggest shows made after the fact but this show kind of came about as a result almost of the fan movement online and of the movement that it was getting like obviously there had been like this had kind of been in the works right since 2017 2018 but like when sopranos press really started to pick up again in 2019 like there was a big movement for this movie and obviously you know it was originally planned to come out in theaters and then the pandemic happened and it forced it to jump release dates a couple of uh you know a, a couple of couple of times actually and then obviously we cut to this year we have the big simultaneous theater and hbo max drop and now the show it, the movie sorry is available to stream on hbo max which again is very antithetical to how david chase wanted it to originally be portrayed like do you have anything to comment on there before we actually like get into this movie and like pick it apart i mean First and foremost, I'm sick and tired of people saying like this should have been a, a mini series. I mean, that's not what David Chase wanted to do. You know right. what I mean? This was always I can like, I can clearly tell this like starting the movie. This was always yeah. intended to be a movie. First. Yeah, and like as far as that's concerned, I think he made a damn solid crime film, and yeah. I and I'm I'm happy in that. As far as like in the pantheon of like crime epics and crime gangster mob movies, like is it one of the very best top ten? That's another discussion, but it could have been. And that's what we'll get into later. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like this movie famously, again, it's been done to death, but we'll do it here again. This movie famously, it functions as one part, the origin story for Tony Soprano kind of coming of age. But like, I want to stop using that as like the marketing centerpiece because that actual portion of the movie takes up very little. It really doesn't come in until like roughly the second hour of the movie. And even then, like the screen time of it feels minimalistic. This is a movie about kind of one half, like kind of still like revisiting like the glory days, obviously, that Tony talked about so much in the run of the show, right? Kind of the 60s, the heyday of the mob in New York, right? And we do follow Christopher's father portrayed by Alessandro Nivola in the movie, Dickie Moltisanti. Famously, again, has kind of this unique part as really being the only character in this entire movie that we really haven't seen or heard of in the show before. Well, not heard of, but really seen in the show in really any capacity. He's the only character here that we don't see in any flashbacks or in any older capacity. He kind of looms over the show as like this figure that like obviously is the source of inspiration for Tony and obviously as like obviously, you know, creates a lot of mixed feelings within and conflicted feelings and adds to Christopher's problems and struggles throughout the show but you what you have here is a movie that is one part a period piece one part again trying to buy into a lot of kind of the you know what's it called quote unquote attempted to tackle race relations in america movies the, of which there has kind of been a part of before which i'll get to how those parts are handled within this movie and of course obviously then you have the origin of the soprano crew and we kind of see like the version of the soprano crew of who we follow throughout the majority of this movie comprised obviously of dickie moltisanti um, Tony's father and uncle, obviously Johnny Boy and Junior Soprano portrayed in this film by John Bernthal and Corey Stoll. Silvio Dante, uh, young Silvio Dante portrayed by John Magaro, young Paulie Walnuts portrayed by Billy Magnuson, young uh, Big Pussy Bompancero portrayed by hopefully I get this right, Samson Mokiola, I believe is how you say his name. And uh, also then you have the, just the Joey Diaz character who's kind of just there. Uh, he's credited as Buddha, but apparently he's supposedly playing Big Pussy's dad. But it's also really confusing. It's never really established. But we're following those characters, obviously. We have young Tony, Michael Gandolfini, who comes in halfway through the movie. And then, obviously, we're also following the Leslie Odom Jr. character of Harold McBrayer, who um, David Chase kind of designs as this viewpoint into the Newark race riot. So, Dustin, mm. going into this movie, right, we, had, we, were, we were talking about this movie up until... The, like the night before it came out, like the night before it came out, we called each other. We had like a three hour long conversation just like about what this movie could be. Mm. And now we've finally seen it. It's finally available to watch. What were your first impressions just as soon as it was done? Just like as soon as it was done. I thought it was solid. You know, I thought it was a solid, really entertaining 
really gripping movie and like the ending itself which we'll talk about later is ending of the year material one of the one of the most satisfying cut to credits in years years yeah yeah and especially given that this is in the year 2021 which that just for like a movie that let's be honest would kind of just be on like it's really really good but not one of the best any other year Except with the exception of the last couple of years, except in 2021, that makes it qualify qualified for like one of the best because of how shitty of a year this has been for movies. I mean, I think the ending would be one of the best of the year, regardless in of any the, year, right? Of, regardless of the year, but like, I th- I still think this movie itself that what we got belongs in this year because even though as good as as good as it is in my opinion, it still could have been better. Like right. so many right. countless films that have come out within not even last year, but primarily this year yeah and and that's funny that you say that obviously like th- that this feels like a film of this year because obviously the movie was famously like so many other movies that we got this year supposed to come out in 2020 which given everything that happened in the real world in 2020 it's kind of a this weird kind of twist of fate almost that this ends up coming out and almost in a weird way acting as like a, a pseudo commentary on the events that we experienced kind of last year you know with kind of just uh-huh. like the non-stop 24-hour news cycle and the george floyd incident with everything else going on there you know so it's mm-hmm. really weird how eerily similar that is and like that's another one of those things where you add where david chase has been asked about it and he's like i i like I, I couldn't have planned this if i tried you know this mm-hmm. is kind of just i was just trying to portray this time as accurately as humanly possible yeah. you know and that's kind of like how it plays out. And like automatically for me off the bat, I'm like, okay, this is not a perfect movie. I don't even know if this is a great movie, but this is easily one of the most solid kind of like sucked in. Like I was sucked into this movie in a way that I have not been sucked in by a lot of other movies this year. Um, Kind of portrait of this time in America and the story that while it wasn't, it wasn't as tight as it could have been. But also because it felt like there was a lot that was missing. Like we'll get like we'll get into that when we get into it. This for me was still one of the absolute best experiences for me of the year, just in general. Not just as a film, not just as kind of like as a like a unintentional like next step as what, far as where cinema as an art form is going, mm. but just on so many different levels, this movie works for me. And I do fully I know that every person that a few people that I know will disagree with me, but I truly do believe that this is something that you can watch both on its own as a as a really enjoyable film. And then obviously, if you have the added baggage of The Sopranos, then you can actually get something really enjoyable out of it as well. Like, do you agree with that? Or yeah, that? absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, it, it is kind of dumb in retrospect already to like watch this movie if you haven't seen any of the show or at least finish the show because the, the narrator of this movie alone spoils the fucking show for True. you. So. True. True. I mean, that's kind of ill-advised, but it still does work as its own movie for sure. I mean, I just needed to be longer. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the number one criticism of this is the fact that already off the bat, this movie is solid. Yeah, so it's mine too. It's mine too. Solid Mm -hmm. two hour film. And we actually could have used more. Like, this is a movie that, how long did you say this could have been, Dustin? Like, three hours, three and a half hours? I would have taken the three, I would have taken a three hour cut of this movie. I would, because it would have been like, honestly, this is the film that I can safely say, like, yeah, if this had been like the full three hours, like, really gone in and explored every single character and kind of that interesting and awesome, introspective way, this could have been the Godfather 2 of its time. Oh, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. It's, yeah, that's a pretty good analogy. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think two hours 45 at the minimum. It could have been a, a classic Easily. territory. Easily. Easily. How did we get How did we get multiple, multiple? We got three, three-hour-long, multimillion-dollar movies that came out in 2019. Avengers Endgame, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and It Chapter 2. You know? And even Rise of Skywalker, I think, was the longest Star Wars movie. It was like two, at, two hours and like almost 45 minutes, I think. It was like it came close to like Last Jedi length. Yeah, and and honestly, even if like you were to talk to David Chase about this and just ask him why under two hours, because it's not even two hours, it's an hour fifty five. Yeah, hour what? Fifty five, fifty four, yeah. It's an hour fifty five, I checked. And like and I've watched this already two, three times this movie, and I've rewatched a lot of clips and you know, just to get a you know, a brighter picture of like, you know, you know, for this review and everything. 
And yeah, it's undeniable just the amount of subplots that he puts in. And there's certain things in the trailers that are left out in the movie. There's certain like shots that I'm just like, where was that? Where was Tony slapping that guy? You know, there's certain things in the backstory. There's definitely, it just feels like, you know, to a lesser degree, you know, compared to Venom, let there be carnage, but there, there feels like so much is left on the cutting room floor just because David Chase and company were just so hesitant. It, to make an over two hour movie. Right. And, and, I'm, and that's the part where I'm wondering, obviously, is that Chase and Company or is that like the editing team at HBO Max as far as that goes, as far as like molding no. this movie down? Like they, it, they put out Zack Snyder's Justice League. Yeah, Who gives true. a shit about true. runtime? Nah, true. I mean, and first of all, this should have been on streaming to begin with because HBO movies, except Sex in the City one and two, don't make money in fucking theaters. I don't like I, this. If this was theater exclusive, it might have done well, but. It wouldn't have done Sex in the City numbers, in my opinion, as as much of a following as we get, you know. Yeah, and it definitely seems like one of those things that, like, yeah. at the end of the day, at, at 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 its best in a traditional theater run, it would have gone down as like a cult film, and that's about yeah, it that's at about most, it. Yeah. you know. Like, uh-huh. this is not the type of movie that, like, unfortunately hits the level of a Scorsese gangster film, which honestly is kind of depressing in retrospect because literally the whole thing about Chase's career is that Chase's biggest regret is not pursuing a film career and just going right into television in the late seventies, you know, and kind of how he complained so much about being stuck in the network TV system. And now he finally has a chance to like have a theatrical movie that could like be well-received, you know, and not kind of suffer the fate that not fade away. His first movie did. And then it it's now simultaneous on HBO max and kind of is used to like kind of along with the Sopranos kind of like legacy, like kind of hype up and like pull more subscribers to HBO max, which essentially has become like the modern day, model for television it's kind of a sick kind of twisted you know sense of irony which in a weird which obviously was such a massively a big part of the sopranos you know that was such a big part of what made the show great that was such a big part of kind of what makes this movie great is the fact that all of these characters are stricken with such self-doubt i'll tell you for me what was probably one of the biggest differences as far as watching this movie versus the show, besides obviously its aim, which is that the show, obviously because of the time that it has, really you get invested in like each and every one of these characters, even like kind of these little like one-off characters that they would bring in for like a couple episodes at the time, but you really got to know and understand them and kind of understand their psychology just through the filmmaking and just through how it was shot and everything in a way that I feel like this movie kind of only gives to a limited amount of characters. Like I'd say it's Alessandro Nivola as Dicky Moltisanti, Ray Liotta, and and the and with the two characters that he plays in this movie because he plays twins. David Chase continues his trend of having twins in shows and, and with his properties. He did that a lot in The Sopranos. But like in a weird way, like the rest of the characters almost feel like kind of just fill in material in a strange way. Like and I, I I get that like kind of it's like okay so this is like how these characters would be in like a more movie esque setting as opposed to a TV setting where we can kind of spend time to get to know them. Like Paulie Walnuts feels like an extra in like a three stooge in, in like a fucking uh, like a Disney channel thing. Like Silvio, I'm sorry to say, I know you love Magaro in this, but Silvio looks like the SNL character that he so easily broke in the last one. Like big pussy. It's the fact that like the dude does not look Italian. So like, that's really <laughs> distracting as far as that goes, you know, oh, and he's like, definitely Hawaiian. Oh that's, my God. It's fact. so obvious. It's he might so be a obvious. little Italian. But yeah. He's, but, like, he's, he's, the, he's Hawaiian. He gets away with it with the name. And like, it doesn't help that like, he look like he's the son of Joey Diaz who also looks strikingly Italian, but also isn't. And like all of that stuff has thrown me off. And like your your point that you brought up about Gilberto's performance was spot on because freaking this is what like I feel like this is like the 18th or 19th time that Bertel's been awesome for like five minutes and something again. Like, come on, like yeah. for me, I'll admit a big part of the selling point of Taylor Sheridan's Those Who Wish Me Dead, which was one of those HBO Max drops that no one watched this year, but I actually thought was pretty good, yeah. is that Bertel actually like had a decent part in that movie. And not just, like, one scene and everything. And he actually played, like, a pretty, like, decent character who, like, actually had, like, a pretty cool fate as far as that goes. Like, and that was probably, like, the most refreshing part. Like, what is it? Like, is it just because he's so busy all the time? Like, why is it that John Berthold can't do more than one scene in movies? I don't know. Like, no, he's in a few scenes. It I know. I'm exaggerating. Like he's but... under, he just feels like he's undercooked yes. in this film. And so it's like, I wanted more of the relationship between him and Vera Farmiga, who's outstanding Standing. in this movie. Standing. Out. Standing. She's incredible in this movie. It steals every moment she has, even if she isn't absolutely integral to the plot until the very end, which you find one out one more detail about Dickie and his death. Spoiler, because I mean it's a prequel, you know, he's a dead guy anyway. 
Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> fuck everybody. It, it becomes pretty obvious throughout a certain point in the movie that Dickie Moult decides he will not make it through this film alive. Oh, like, it becomes yeah. pretty obvious. Oh, for sure. But, like, I wanted more. Like, it just seems like Martin Scorsese is the only person in Hollywood capable to giving us, like, a like a satisfying John Bernthal bit performance. It's just, like, for Wolf of Wall Street, like, I think he's in that movie, per- like, perfectly, even if he's not in it a lot. Like, Every every other movie that he's in, specifically crime movies, it's just like I want more John Bernthal. Yep. I want more out of this character. I can literally pull up my letterbox. I, I literally have under Widows. it like Cameo King. Yeah, well, yep. I literally have it Cameo King. Like I'm in 15 movies, so in this order from behind Wolf of Wall Street, Those Who Wish Me Dead, Baby Driver, We Are Your Friends, Me Earl and the Dying Girl. I have many saints next. The accountant, Wind River, Ford vs. Ferrari, Peanut Butter Falcon, Sicario, Widows, Night at the Museum, um, what's it called? Battle of the Smithsonian, Date Night, and Grudge Match. Like, he's in all of those movies. And he has like bit part. Uh, he has like actual parts in like what? Three of them? Two That's it? Yeah, Two like, or three. Like Fury, yeah. Fury and the Accountant. Yes. Which, he, which the accountant is underrated, but he's fucking awesome in that. Yes, but he like, is great in that. And like he's fucking Tony Soprano's dad, and I want, and I want, and my main problem with his character is that we didn't get enough of him to to really feel like convinced as to why Tony is so gravitated more towards Dickie Moltisanti than his actual father. That's like kind of like the excess stuff that like if it is if it's in there, it fleshes out the scenery so much more. Like, because I'm not gonna lie, a big part of the end, like the ending, still worked for me, but like the scene where Tony is trying to like get into the warehouse to see Dickie and Dickie's refusing to see him. Like it feels unearned almost, you know, mm. and kind of like even the scene where Dickie ends up spoilers, but Dickie ends up drowning his, you know, his, his Gumar fucking because he finds out that she has slept with Harold, obviously uh, Leslie mm. Odom Jr.'s character. And when we'll get to him, don't worry, we're saving him Um, in this like really despicable scene. It's almost like, like the, like the scene that, the the film tries to capture his essence and like show him as like okay he is the original Tony Soprano like it's almost like it's like the film is almost like kind of trying to do this like supernatural essence of like okay how how like with the with with the pinky thing at the end how like Dickie transfers what's left of his essence into Tony and that's like good, you and like you see of, Tony yeah. like embodying like Dickie for throughout the series and all of a sudden so many more of Tony's actions like make so much more sense like it adds so much more context and rich like that much deep layering as far as that goes you know like an ogre within between these two properties and like it really really turns this into something into something special i find like because every scene with dicky like could we just could we just nerd out about nivola for a second because like holy shit like you want to talk about the definition of a star making performance we we haven't had one of these in quite a long time honestly like it's like that and like a classic mob yes. performance yeah like just a classic like gritty mob performance from somebody who isn't like johnny depp you yes. know what I mean? Like Johnny, that was like the last one that comes to my head to be like, that was a fucking awesome mob performance. Yes. But like, Alessandro Navola, like, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, Dustin, honestly. break it down. Like, this guy has been, this guy has been like, kind of like, do, again, popping up in these small parts, but in all these great movies over the last yeah. couple of years. And he finally gets and the one chance to shine. He's memorable. Yeah. Like, what, what was the first time that you remember seeing him? Because for me, obviously, it's like, I, I obviously he's noticeable in Face Off as the brother in Face Off, but like, uh-huh. he's had like a long career. But like, when do you remember first seeing him? I don't know if this was the first time, but it, it had to have been like one of the first. And it was American Hustle. It was probably American Hustle was the first time I saw right. him where he was like Bradley Cooper's like boss. Like he was like Bradley Cooper's like. Uh, yeah, the he, FBI, the head of the FBI, like yeah, the one like, head of the one step above Louis C.K. Yeah. And I remember he was like really memorably funny and charming in that movie, too. And like just kind of slimy in that. And like then he was in like a most violent year and he was kind of like the main antagonist in that movie opposite Oscar Isaac. And even though it's a small, relatively smaller role compared to a lot of other supporting players in that, he really makes an impression. And it's he's great in that. And, I, and I've heard he's been great in a bunch of other stuff. But then he was in Art of Self Defense with Jesse Eisenberg, Yeg, and he was so fucking great in that movie. And just like, I was so glad when that movie came out because that's when they were making this movie. And I was like, yeah, this guy is going to be a fucking star. And like with this performance, like he he definitely didn't disappoint. Him and Vera Farmiga, I have nothing. 
to complain about. Like, they yeah, were phenomenal. It, it's awesome as far as like kind of how those two specific performances compare and how those two performances are kind of like the two kind of mm-hmm. ones that we are that we like kind of praise the most coming out mm-hmm. of this movie, right? And how they have such vastly different tasks. Where Vera Farmiga, it becomes immediately apparent that she did her homework. Like she listened to recording after recording and like truly embodied it, like almost in a strange way, brought the late great Nancy Marshawn back from the dead. It was kind yes. of uncanny how well she captured her essence. And even though her parts were small, they were just like well enough to inform them. Um, and friggin'. Uh, what's it called? And then with Navola and what he's bringing, like it's like you nailed it completely. He just ca- like every tone that he brings on, like is legit. Like he just he captures. He doesn't qu- the, what he does is he captures what makes Chase leading man interesting. Is he captures their like their facial twitches? Like Tony Soprano, what made him so apparent is like the facial acting that you saw from him was just on another level as far as how he's able yeah. to portray like you know like how his grunts and his you know his wheezy breathing as he gets on and on and like how he just seems to have the weight of the world on him, like. The Vola does a fucking awesome job translating that to the big screen as far as like kind of showing like how torn this character is. And well, I will say yeah. that kind of like the quote unquote like therapy sessions and kind of quote unquote Dickie's good deeds, quote unquote, kind of like compare. Those were the parts of like I felt like there was a little bit of a dissonance there. But for the most part, like this for me was like a mm-hmm. star making performance as far as I'm concerned. It's performance of the year material right now. Just for me, for, for my money, at least. Like, I haven't seen, like, for me, it's weird because, like, two years ago with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, that was, like, a reaffirmation, right, of yeah. Brad Pitt's movie star status because Brad Pitt, like, really hadn't had that, like, that level of a status, like, for quite some time, like, at least in the public limelight. And that movie kind of brings him back. And this movie, like, absolutely, I'm hoping does this for Alessandro Nivola, you know? It should, and it and it, he deserves it. And, like, just to, to comment on your, on your opinion about the Ray Liotta scenes, like, yeah, I like those scenes because it, it it didn't feel like a direct copy of the Melfi scenes. It felt like the Navola character like sloppily trying to like impress his uncle and and trying to like convince himself that he is a good person and that whole bullshit about like the blind baseball like that, yeah. that was obviously way, well, obviously a, a hallucination like that that, yeah. that, that, that never happened that never that was, happened i would no it wasn't it was a lie is what it was he was describing it to ray Liotta, and then at the end of the the the, the image we see we see everyone saying he's a saint he's a saint or whatever they were saying and i was just like shut the fuck up this is hilarious <laughs> like, yeah it was it, it, it was really confusing. One, one more scene. thing. My favorite scene with Vera Farmiga was probably the scene with the guidance counselor. Yeah. Which, also, like, yeah. which, which was great. And it, it added so much. Like, it added another layer to the Nancy right. Marshawn performance right. itself. It kind of, you know Answer what it was? a little bit of that relationship between you know, them. You know what it was for me? It yeah. was the thing of where it's like, it. It, it, it wrapped up Livia's story because the whole thing uh-huh. about Livia's story in the run of the Sopranos is she died before like kind of Chase and company really had a chance to like wrap up her arc. And so this was kind of like, okay, we got to spend a little bit more time with her. Cause like, I swear, like Vera has some freaking like witchcraft in her because like the, she literally summons Nancy back from the dead and like has her possess her. It's fucking yeah. crazy. Yeah. People are saying she kind of emulates Edie Falco and I don't really agree with that. I, I, mean, I don't see that. I don't, I don't really see that at I, all. I mean, I guess like, the personality is sort of like, like sort of reminiscent of like who he becomes attracted to, to want to be, become his wife. I, I like, I kind of see that, but I don't see her it, like Edie Falco in that performance. I, I see her like respectfully, you know, mimicking Nancy Marchand in the most accurate way. And it's just, just a respectful performance and it shouldn't be a, an overlooked one either yeah. by the time the Academy comes around. Cause this, yeah, this is a fucking if amazing the- performance. If the Academy even looks around at this, but honestly, like you, yeah. you think that if any of that, because here's the problem, right? Is that even though this movie plays in theaters, right? I'm wondering if the Academy will like shunt this to the side, you they know? Will. But like, I'm, um, but like, of all the actresses that like could break through, like obviously besides Navola, who again that would only work if they ran a lead actor campaign for him. But would, um, would Vera Farmiga potentially have a chance? Do you think? I mean, it depends on how much people are really talking about that performance and like the precursor awards, like the critics awards. Who knows? I think she deserves it, though, personally, because I think it's a great performance. And I think it's a memorable one already. And and I'm going to like it by the time the year ends. And I think she's going to be among the best in that category. Yeah, she's she's my number one for supporting actress for right now. Yeah. Supporting actress drama. She's Mm -hmm. it's it's unbelievable as far as what she brings. And like a couple of the other role players that I wanted to talk about before I just like kind of wanted to talk about Harold and kind of the show in general. Obviously, we get Corey Stoll as Uncle Junior. We get perfect. uh, Perfect. 
perfect. Had, like Corey Stoll is such a great character actor as far as like kind of what he does in each role, kind of hopping from role to role. There was seemed like a brief period where he was going to be like a big action star, and then he went right back to TV. Obviously, you know. Also, as you pointed out, in the last great uh, mob movie that came out in Black Mass, right, <laughs> with, with kind of his performance, and again, just another. What what is it like? What third act entry, right? Third act entry, and he completely takes over. Like kind of like yeah. Talk talk about him for a second. Yeah, I really liked Corey Stoll a lot, and I thought he was a perfect junior. I don't know why this movie didn't use him as an antagonist, like a full on yeah. antagonist. I Which don't know why. Because in the third act, it kind of almost ends. It's like oh, he was a secret antagonist, but like that that gets into some of my problems with the third act, just in yeah, general. And and it's just like the bait and switch and shit, and it's just ridiculous with him. And and it's like, all right, if you were gonna pull that with his character, why not have him in the movie more? You know what I mean? Like he's not in it enough to justify that switch. And if it's good, and if we're just judging it off of uh, like, oh, he laughed at him. He he thinks less of it. He laughed when he slept it. When he yeah, slept. Yeah, he laughed at him. Yeah. Well, I mean, the emphasis obviously like, also is that like is that like Tony is spending too much time with this guy who's not even his uncle, but he you know, but like Junior obviously wants to spend time with like him, his real uncle. And like Junior is obviously portraying this as being like kind of pathetic and not as competent as he may have seen before. Like, that's another thing that I wanted to talk with you about real quick is yeah. the show goes out of its way to recreate like certain scenes. Like, like there are lines and like scenes that we are told and shown in flashback material in the show that is presented as that that is presented as actual scenes in this movie and certain of them happen exactly like they happen in the show and certain of them happen like just a little bit differently like the story obviously they have the story in which johnny shoots livia's bee hair hive mm-hmm. um is uh with happens in the show and is told actually in the next episode that we're getting to on the sopranos podcast um uh the one where that story is told about how it was junior in the car not dicky so, like, would you think that, like, obviously, you, you know that that's a deliberate choice on David Chase's part. But if you know that if you try to ask him about it, he'll be, like, ambiguous. And he'll be like, oh, what do you think about it? Basically? It'll be one of those things. It'll be like, oh, it's it's meant to, like, it could be either or. It could be, like, the character's memory or it could be what actually happened. And, like, the characters just remember it differently, you know? Like, kind of either way, he kind of messes around purposefully with the chronology uh, in that way, you know? And I'm not necessarily sure if that's to the benefit. Like, it makes for some great scenes in the movie. But, like, I don't know. Like, like what, what are your kind of your thoughts on that? I was thinking like whatever's in the movie and specifically, you know, since it's narrated by fucking Christopher Moltisanti, it's just like, I guess we're supposed to like take everything that we're seeing as true as that like actually happened because all the characters in Sopranos, even when we get flashbacks, they're all fucking liars. And that's what David Chase really told Alessandro Novolo while preparing for this character. It's like, don't listen to what anybody said about Dickie Moltisanti on The Sopranos because they're all fucking liars. That's what right. he said. And it's like, okay, so I guess we got to take this movie a little more seriously, but then to not really give us a, a clear cut who the fuck killed Dickie Moltisanti, we just know who set it up, it, that's a little fucking annoying. Right. And I, I, I Corey Stoll needed more screen time. He, no, let's talk about Magero and Magnus. Yeah, let's Reagan. get to it. I've been trying to avoid it this entire time, but we got to talk about them because well, you and I, we no. have differing thoughts, I'll say, on it, to say the least. No, because at least Magero, he was given more to do, presumably. Oh, sure, sure. And, and he was actually playing a character who's already an exaggerated character to begin I mean, with, played, I, yes, by, a, like, played by a non-actor. But, but, but here's where I'm going to... has more acting experience than Van Sant does. But here's what I'm going to... But here's where I'm going to disagree with you, is that the whole thing about it is that you're 100% right about how Van Zandt is introduced in the show, but Silvio Dante ends up growing into, like, kind of this, like... You know, you know, like just another one of the gangsters as far as like this cold blooded killer. Like, and you, you, you kind of like get invested in him and like understand him more as a character and a human being. Oh, I and get like, that. And yeah. it, it feels like Magaro of all of the three of them, kind of like as the original trio from season one, as kind of far as all of those guys are concerned, it kind of just goes along the ways of, oh, he's just like doing the impression of Silvio. Like, without like kind of, he, it, it feels like kind of the most impressionistic of the three of them without kind of having like a lot of most of the substance. I'm not saying that Billy Magnuson or the other guy is that much yeah. better, but yeah. like Magaro for me is the one where it's like, wow, that was also, the one I was looking forward to the most, you know? Okay. I say that some of what you said is fair, 
I'd also say he has the most to do out of the three of them. Sure. And, and I th- and I think that says a lot too. Where where it's like if they really didn't nail the voice, I don't think he'd be in it as much. And I oh, think yeah. he do- I think he does nail the voice, which is already an exaggerated voice. And he and he brings a lot of heart to the character, which Silvio's known for. And he's a younger version of the character, so he doesn't need to be as hard you know, as tough as he'd be, but he gets the sense of humor down. Billy Magnuson, on the other hand, who I'm not even sure is Italian in any way. I, 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 I want to know who lost the role of Pauly Walnuts while auditioning for this movie to Billy Magnuson. I really want to know because like he, he, all he's there to do is do, you know, make funny faces, do a weird impression of Pauly Walnuts, you know, Tony Sirico and he's just posturing the whole time. And I, I, I you know, physically, I guess he kind of nails some of it, but he's just there to do like the, mm, and like the, you know, I, dab, it's dab, way, dab, dab. yeah, it's way more of a caricaturist performance and he has way less to do. And I think that's on purpose. And like David Chase didn't even really want to talk about Billy Magnuson while promoting this movie. Yeah. And, and it's, it's very apparent because he's in like what, five scenes, like and, five, five minutes of this movie. And Dominic, I'll say this too. I was watching an interview that Collider just did like right before, like a couple hours ago. And even Billy Magnuson said that he was the worst out of everyone, but he, wow. still, but he still had a fun time doing it. And it does wow. look like he was, he was having a fun time. I like Billy Magnuson. It's not a fucking terrible, worthy performance or anything, but like he is, you know, he's just not in it enough. The other guy who plays Big Pussy sounds like Big Pussy. He's just tan and a lion. So I don't, <laughs> but Magaro to me, like, I think they gave him the screen time they gave him for a reason. And like, he definitely, that last scene with, with, uh, Dicky Moltisanti and him was definitely like, just, just that, that was just, great. That, that was legitimately a me. great scene. Yeah. And, and that. I think Magaro makes it work a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think it's like beyond like him just doing that Silvio look. Yeah. I think, I, I think it's a commendable performance. Yeah. And I, you, and you, I, you know why that scene in particular worked for me was because that was yeah. the scene where it's like, okay, this is Silvio and Tony before Silvio mm-hmm. and Tony. This is like the preview. This is like Silvio and Tony 1.0, you know, but mm-hmm. with, with like kind of his advice to Dickie as far as that goes. Like that, that's again the thing that contributes to Navola's performance overall is that again, you see kind of the true inspiration for Tony Soprano, right? Because we haven't even gotten to Michael Gandolfini yet, as far as that goes. Because the whole thing yeah. with Michael Gandolfini is he comes in and his whole thing is if he's if, if Navola is kind of like who Tony's gonna like grow into, then Gandolfini is like the younger version. Of that, you know, like it's it's kind of it's all the best parts of Tony, like before it kind of becomes weighed down and like the Livia and the panic attacks and the constantly sleeping around and kind of like just the overall violence of the gangster world and how much of a ruthless, cold blooded killer he becomes. Like he's Tony Soprano before all yeah. of that. But interestingly enough, this very much like the, the Leslie Odom Jr. character. It almost feels like there should have been more here, you know? Absolutely. Like that whole like last like scene, you know, when he goes to the warehouse and Silvio turns him away, like and then Navola is like breaking down, laughing and crying because of how sad he is that he can't spend time with his nephew anymore. There feels like there was a scene before that establishing like. Yeah, but I guess it was the Carmela scene, you know, like uh, like him just hanging up yeah. the phone. And, you know, Drastic the, underuse of young Carmela, though, by the way. And and she's related to Dickie, too. So I thought she she could have been a little bit more integral to the story. The girl that they got to play teenage Janice was great. And yes. I want a little bit more of her as well. Yes, but she was agreed. used well. Um, I wanted a young Ralphie, too. That's just a yes. nitpick. But before I get into my opinion, like, uh, Michael, one, one last nitpick. But like the fact that yeah. it's like it's young Tony, young yeah. Jackie. And it was right. Who doesn't come in until the ice cream scene is that and young Artie like that kind of throws me off. It's like, well, Artie was in their gang. Really? Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean, kind of. <laughs> I mean, like, that, kinda, that, scene, like, that scene didn't even really make sense to me. Yeah, was that, that like, was just kind of like, oh, like there are a lot of kind of like just random vignettes in this movie that it's like, oh, OK, those don't these don't necessarily have to do with the plot, but they're just like fun character moments. Right. Like, but like that, that felt like a deleted scene, but that had the lead into the next scene with, where they're in the car and the beehive and everything. Yeah, so of like, course. But right uh, one right before I get into Michael Gandolfini. Uh, and what I think about him, I just the one the one thing Billy Magnuson did in this movie that was impressive yeah. was one line that he had. And it was the line in the bar where, where Leslie Odom's like, whatever the fuck that is. And he's like, hey, watch it. Language. There's ladies here. <laughs> and I was like, all right. He sounded like him that one time. All right. Moving on to Michael Gandolfini. <laughs> uh, I thought Michael Gandolfini was absolutely fantastic, but he was completely <laughs> underused. But whenever he was in it, the scenes really did feel like they were breathing and like they were just like so full of 
just emotion and just pure raw feeling that scene between him and his mother in the kitchen was a highlight yeah, that for was me. oh man that uh, was i'm like this has scene of the year potential like, yeah that's one shit. of the best scenes and it, it really captured their relationship from that age and i just was completely convinced and i'm just like i wanted more of that kind of shit into this movie I like more scenes that felt like they were breathing the scene on uh you know the beach where we were talking about with alessandro novola that felt like straight out of a 70s movie and it yeah. was just like yeah yeah but, I felt like I was watching yeah. like one of the Godfather movies. Yeah, but like Michael Gandolfini, he was very good, and he definitely did the job right. I mean, he definitely did his job. I mean, that's what he was paid to do, and especially that final shot of the fucking movie. I mean, I yeah. mean, that's that's Tony Soprano. Yeah, and, and it, Michael, it really. Michael Imperioli even says it. That's the yeah, guy that's right the guy there. Who, that's like, the guy who I went he to really hell is. for. And I'm he like, really that, that war. It's like that for me, <laughs> that last line, that tied it all together. Like that was yeah. the tie in the knot. It's like, okay, that as young Tony Soprano. Like he really like, oh. it's so weird because this is the year where like, again, like the sons of late great actors are like coming to replace mm-hmm. him between Gandolfini and then obviously later Cooper Hoffman, uh, the son of uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman and Paul Thomas Anderson's upcoming Licorice Pizza, which if we get to, re- you and I are doing something for that for this podcast. because like, I want to be, yeah, I want to talk about that. That's going to be like yeah. a three hour long podcast. Like and we're just going to talk about like liquor. It's going to be longer than the movie. We're, we're going to talk about all the PTA's movies. It's going to be awesome. Like that, that's, that, that right. could be our like ending of the year, like a PTA retrospective, Dom and Dustin. But, um, yeah. what's it called? Like that, that would be cool. But, uh, back to many scenes in Newark, like the old, like as far as like kind of what Gandolfini brought to the part, as far as like kind of like the tenderness, it was all the parts that we love about Tony Soprano that made him so likable. The fact that he was, he could at times be this tender soul that he had this great kind of love of like innocence of like animals of like, you know, and like how much he did truly love his kids as far as that goes. And he was a great dad, at least for the first couple seasons, you know, like it, it, he embodies all of those feelings, you know, kind of it's the Tony Soprano, like kind of before the muck sets in, you know, and kind of the ending kind of solidifies. It's like, yeah, he will kind of never experience kind of this idealized life that kind of the people who do see through all the not, sense of of in which he grew up kind of see for him you know to kind of see the potential that he has or and that everyone tells him you know the thing that's echoed to him in the test stream in uh in season five when the, when he confronts the coach and the coach set tells him he's not prepared that he would have been a great coach you know like i i will say though that's probably the only aspect where i'm like okay aside from like what him just like leading kids and like criminal activities they say okay he could be a great leader i'm like that feels a little bit too expository for me you know i mean yeah that's a little too like feeding you too much yeah. information where it's just like he she could have just said he's really smart you know what i mean yeah like he has potential he, she didn't right. have to be like he's a leader Wait. which is weird because like, that was like because that was like a rip from the fucking um from, from the season five thing when he confronts tony b steve buscemi's character about uh killing the killing joey peeps and he's like oh you got an iq of 168 you know it was the week you got tested all the nuns were raving about it you know, mm-hmm. and that's kind of like what he th- that that's kind of like how that riffs. Like as far as that goes, like because there were there were a lot of polls, there were a lot of riffs, there were a lot of scenes recreated from the show. Like kind of well, if you had to pick like one scene and one line from the show that was kind of replicated in the movie, which ones would you pick? And the he doesn't have the makings of a varsity athlete. He doesn't have the makings of a varsity yeah, athlete. Of obviously. Of uh, course. But um I don't know. That's a very specific question. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe yeah. a Christopher line. Yeah, uh, I, I I would probably go with um obviously the the Christopher line at the end um that's the guy who I went to hell for, and um the making for for me it was live when when Vera Farmiga turns around with Olivia look and it's just like oh poor you and just like the way yeah. that she phrases that and like you see like you just see him like shrink down you see how like that one phrase just kind of melts any residual warmth that he just had you know it's it's fucking like death defying and then as far as scene and recreation go like for me it's probably the scene that's like replicated from down next season one episode seven Uh where obviously you see johnny and junior and they're associated getting arrested and the one guy running and getting shot and a couple times in the back you know that's like kind of the scene that really sticks out the most to me as far as that goes like i guess the only thing to really wrap this up as far as that goes is like where does this compare? Like, where where does this go as far as, like, within the canon of gangsters? Like, how does this stand to have its own brand identity outside of The Sopranos just in general? I think it definitely stands out among, like, one of the better gangster movies that we've gotten just because of the pedigree involved. And, uh, by the way, it's shot magnific- magnificently. Amazingly well. Incredible cinematography. Yeah, by the guy that shot Terminator Genesis. What? That's who that is? Yeah, I think so. 
Oh God. Kramer Morgenthau. Damn, I gotta look this. I gotta verify this now. That's I'm crazy. Sir Kramer Morgenthau, and I shot the many saints of Newark. Kramer Morgenthau. Mm-hmm. Thor: The Dark World, Terminator Genesis. Wow. Yeah, Thor: The Dark World, the the dullest looking Marvel movie, oh, the worst MCU movie. But he also did Chef too, so there's that. Oh yes, Chef. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so like that's that that's what you would say. Like, where where does this like stand as far as like in the pedigree? Like, are we talking like upper echelon? Like, does this movie kind of like get forgotten? right below that? Like, right okay. below that, I wouldn't say it's going to be forgotten. Okay, I don't like think it. It's like, it's not like kind of like we have like the A plus plus tier. Obviously, your Godfather's, your Goodfellas, pretty much any like kind of higher up score yeah. CC movie, uh, minus Casino. I feel like um, Donnie Brasco should be in there. I feel like um, no, what else? Not Donnie Brasco, really? No. Really? Forget about it. Oh man. Oh man. Well, Forget what, what, about that overrated movie. What okay, about well, American Gangster? American Gangster, that should be up there. Once Upon a Time in America, I think should be up there. Yeah. Um, that's another thing we should do is like we should do like out like what 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 are some of the best crime movies ever and like do a ranking system of that. Like yeah, and if you talk count about like hood movies. movies, what about Menace to Society? Menace, and, if you do count hood yeah. movies, we that's something we still have to figure yeah. out though. We still still have to, still have to figure out like when we talk about crime movies, right? Yeah. Does that include like all, is that an umbrella of all crime movies or like do hood no? But movies? if we're talking like mobster movies and we're ranking this in like the pantheon right. of like mo- like Italian mobster movies, right? Because that's like kind of its own subgenre or too, Italian, as as Ita- Ita- I guess Italian Irish kind of like you know they combined. intertwine a point they, yeah. they kind of intertwine like i would I, like the, it, this isn't as good as the departed or anything right or yeah. good fellas or even the irishman but right like it's it's below that it's like right. a little below that it's just not amazing right exactly yeah. that's yeah. exactly how i would categorize it and for that i'm giving this movie four out of five stars like i ranked exactly it four and a half that. on letterbox and yeah. but I'm, I'm docking it back down to a four out of five stars this was again one of the best most solid efforts of the year. Again, if you're a Sopranos fan, I think you're really going to enjoy this. I think you're going to get a lot out of this just in general and not just for the callbacks and the fan references. This is, to me, a great installment in the American kind of crime uh, you know, gangster uh, movie kind of like movement that we've been seeing, you know, like kind of the last couple of years, it kind of like brought that genre back from the dead in a way that like it kind of hadn't been around for a couple of years, you know, you, and you have the masters back at it, you know, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what this, this is as an example, like David Chase, I think kind of takes everything that he wanted to say about the Newark race riots, obviously. And uh, real quick to just do a quick sidebar about Leslie Odom Jr. Yes, like, I was going to just say. Uh, yeah, thanks. I, I almost forgot about him. Mm-hmm. Damn. Um, Like this is the first thing you've seen him in. Oh yeah, that's the first. This is the first thing I've seen him in. Yeah, yeah. Like and, I like, thought he was very good in it. I just thought like the first half of the movie, he like his the, the writing for his character was stronger. But right when they started like you know putting putting him with Michaela De Rossi, who's also very good in this, very film, good. Yeah, but the writing really undercuts yes. that character and performance. And I just feel like just making them cheat on each other and then her just admitting it to Navola just yeah, made it just that, very that, inorganic. Very, very forced, very yeah, inorganic. It kind of yeah. like just seems like a rush move to get this action done and like and, get her out of the movie. And then Leslie Odom Jr., you know, he brings up Frank Lucas and then he sees Frank Lucas, you know, the character that, the real life guy that Denzel Washington played in American Gangster. By the way, nothing is, those are completely nothing different. Happens. Like that no, is no. just... Yeah, I was going to say they're completely different performances, the Denzel and the, whoever the fuck this guy was. But like, uh, yeah, there's nothing to that scene and there's really no payoff to it. And like you think Leslie Odom Jr. is going to you know, be involved with it. But then like the one thing I want to say before I get into my rating about Dickie Moltisanti getting like murdered and everything, you were you and I were kind of talking about it. And I was asking you like how you felt, like who do you think? really shot him and you were saying it's the fucking cop that chris killed in the soprano it could very well still be that's what i'm saying Only and I'm i like, know it was a corrupt cop and i'm like yeah i don't think this movie really needed to make it a mystery of like literally who shot him i, I really i like they could have like let us know they right. could have they could have given us the satisfaction for like the soprano the diehard sopranos fans. you know what's funny about that you know what's funny about that so i yeah. actually have like kind of like a, a, a theory as to what that is so i was watching this i was watching this i was I was, yeah. let's just say i was on a date when i was watching this uh-huh. and um the, you know, when we were finished, you know, my date obviously pointed out, it's like, damn, that's their cut to black ending. And I'm like, what? And I thought about it. And I'm like, shit, you're right. That's how they're going to be like intentionally ambiguous, you know, is they're going to leave the who shot Dicky Moltisanti as an attempt to kind of replicate the energy that came yeah. from the Sopranos ending of is Tony alive or dead? You know, that's exactly what that is. 
Sure, but at the same time, like if this was longer and if they actually like gave us a hint of who it could have been and if it was that cop that Chris killed in The Sopranos, like that's who Billy Magnuson should have played. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He yeah. should have played that guy. Instead. Yeah. That's absolutely true. And but, get uh, Emery Cohen to play fucking Polly Walnuts. That would, that would have Co- been a better cast. Emery Cohen would have been perfect. Yeah. <laughs> like he's what, Italian. What, what has happened? Like, what has happened? Like, where has that guy gone in the last I don't couple know. of years? He's eating some meatball parm <laughs> or some shit. I don't know. But anyways, so um, I wanted to get back to, yeah, uh, Leslie Odom Jr. Like as far as that goes, because like his part here is like really interesting in the sense of like, okay, so he's clearly obviously the avatar for the Newark race rides when those kind of break out. And like, I think that those scenes, they did a really good job. Like he definitely embodied like Catherine Bigelow a little bit yeah. as far as like kind of like capturing like kind of the violence and kind of the cons- consistently like warlike atmosphere as far as that goes. And I think like kind of the, some of the visual references of like the gangsters traveling through like kind of the war zone and see like the effects of it. It kind of like was, you know, kind of, re- you know, kind of like um, a moment of clarity for them in that sense. But um, yeah, it was so it was cool. Like it was it was shot well, like those riot scenes. But I still don't think that part of the movie really like added that much to the rest of it. Like I just agree. Those parts felt almost like very underwritten. Like it was almost like like that was supposed to just be a backdrop. And like the, 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 the movie wasn't trying to make as much of a statement about that as like it may have been like claiming to be. Yeah. And then Leslie Odom Jr., like at the end when we get like that unnecessary mid cut mid credit scene where it's like, Oh, everything's yeah. just okay with him. Yeah. Like, and like, who are you supposed to even be in the future of the Sopranos? Right. Like, like, what are you, what is this supposed to signify? Like, yeah, I don't have a problem with that performance. I just don't understand like yeah. what that character it's because the role and the characterization goes nowhere. It's like, yeah. okay, so he's working for Dickie in the beginning. Dickie obviously kind of like had, they, they have this like special bond, even though Dickie kind of like doesn't respect him as a human being. Then yeah. he like, kind of like needs to leave town. Then he comes back. He starts to like get more involved with his community. He starts to like kind of form his own thing. Obviously this brings him back into conflict with Dickie and all that and then the mm. end is like okay they're clearly setting up for like some type of like you know su- typical soprano surprise hit and then nothing happens mm-hmm. nothing happens he literally just walks away and he's fine and it's like he becomes an afterthought in the in the in the last like kind of like 10 15 minutes of the movie until the post credit team which almost kind of reminds you like oh yeah he's still here you know that was such a blue ball moment because yeah. like we were already like in that like woke up this morning. They got played the theme song. And, and then it it's was like, oh, uh, there's Leslie utilized. Odom Jr. There's Leslie Odom Jr. at it. <laughs> It's just disappointing. so dumb. It's but disappointing. Like, but, because again, you're right. The performance is great because like the yeah. whole first half of the movie is those two. And like they're yeah. kind of back and forth. And it's like amazing. Like kind of like as far as like how he like respects this guy like outside of like kind of like the rest of the gangsters who just have like kind of their typical racist attitudes towards him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it it was just kind of repetitive after a while, every scene with him, but he was fine in it. I just like, it it needed to be two and a half hours, this movie or three. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, David Chase. I know you don't love, you know, long movies, I guess, but like, this needed to be long. Yeah, this needed to be longer. Because and if like, it was longer, people would love it more. I'm yeah, telling you. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with that more. And so with that being said, people, that is our review. of. And the I give it. A, I also give it a strong four out of five. Yeah, sorry. Sorry if that wasn't clear enough right. before as far as that goes. But yeah, <laughs> four out of five stars for the many states of Newark. It is my number two favorite movie of the year so far. And that are th- uh, that is our thoughts on the many states of Newark and Venom. Let there be carnage dust. And I wanted to thank you for coming back on once again. I can't mm-hmm. wait to have you back on more. I have a feeling that things are going to get very interesting going forward from here on out. Where can the good people find you on the interwebs? You can find me on YouTube, Mr. G Movie Reviews. You can find me on Letterbox, Dustin Mason. And you can follow me on Twitter. Dominic will leave the links in the bio. Yes, indeed, so. I will. And of course, people, once again, thank you for tuning into yet another Talking TV podcast. We're only getting October started. We're just about to wrap up our Shocktober Halloween first time watch. Talking Thrones is still continuing every single Sunday. Dustin and I, we have we have a couple of products that we have lined up for the channel that is coming to you very, very soon. It's gonna be there's gonna be a lot to look forward to still for these lat for the last 
financial quarter, the best financial quarter of the year of 2021. You can help us out by clicking the subscribe button below, clicking the bell next to it, clicking the like button on this video, you know, upping us in the YouTube algorithm space. You can also follow us on our social media pages at Talking TV Podcast on both Facebook and Instagram. You can follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Movie Note Reviews and make sure you follow Chris on Facebook, Twitter, and everywhere else that he makes music at Christian Ivanko. All one word. And with that being said, people, from myself, from Dustin, Peace out, Mother Fs. It's the summer of love. And watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys next time.